Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Well, welcome to this very special lecture, and I thank you all for coming. I hope as many of you are recovered from the convention, they'll be there eventually. But first, we have an important announcement. I'd like to welcome and introduce our new Canberra Skeptics new president, Lauren Crockett. Say a few words. Please. Fantastically, from Canberra Skeptics, the convention was a resounding success. So, thank you to Kevin for all his work and the committee for the rest of that. Um, looking forward to 2014. Uh, if anyone isn't on our mailing list yet, uh, please email mail at canberraskeptics.org.au. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or join us on Meetup as well. And so, we're really looking forward to uh, bringing you wonderful evenings just like this one next year. Thank you very much. And now on to tonight's speaker. Well, tonight's speaker is Professor Lawrence Krauss. Professor Krauss is a renowned cosmologist and foundation professor and director of the Origins Project at Arizona State University. He's the author of over more than 300 scientific publications and eight books, including the best-selling The Physics of Star Trek and the recipient of numerous international awards for his research and writing. He received his PhD in Physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1982 and then joined the Hart Society of Fellows. In 1985, he joined the Faculty of Physics at Yale, moving, to, moving in 1993 to become Chairman of the Physics Department at Cal Case Western Reserve University before taking up his current position at ASU in 2008. He is a frequent newspaper and magazine editorialist and appears regularly on radio and television and we are absolutely delighted to have him back. So, please welcome Professor Lawrence Krauss. <laughs> First off, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Nambri and Nungawal people pay their respect, pay our respect sorry, to their elders past and present. Now, tonight is a question and answer session, so it's up, up to you, ladies and gentlemen. If you've got some interesting questions, please be, feel free to fire away. Questions relating to the Higgs boson will be not taken kindly because last time we asked about the Higgs boson, he took up half the lecture on that one question. So, well, that, so I'm happy to do that again. <laughs> okay, so I'll start off with the first question. If you want to have questions, just put your hand up and either Amanda or Nick will come see you. Professor Krauss, what, in your opinion, was the biggest scientific discovery or event over the last 12 months? Well, I was confirmed <laughs> less than 12 months ago. By the way, I, in my affiliations, you should mention that I'm also a professor at Australian National University, so I think that's a relevant thing for this audience. Um, I, I, I have a position here as well, which I'm very proud of. Um, let's see, other than the Higgs boson, in the last 12 months, um, there's been a lot of interesting news regarding space, regarding uh, Mars, from the, from the Mars rover, about, uh, about the nature of, uh, of the planet and the possibilities or impossibilities of life on, uh, on Mars. I think that's a, uh, uh, another huge, huge result. And there's also been a lot of interesting results in, in another field, not physics but, um, or, or, or astronomy, but uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on our evolutionary background, on, on hominids and, and our relationship to other hominid species. That's been confusing, and that's wonderful, as I often say. If you're a scientist, that it's best to stay to be in as confused or wrong, um, because there's something to learn. And and we're very confused about hominids because all, many, much of the conventional wisdom about our relationship to both Neanderthals and and others, other and the history of um, of uh, of the the movement out of Africa of, of humans and uh, of, hom of Homo sapiens and and the Neanderthals and these other species called Anisovans. Um, all of it with recent DNA um, evidence has really gotten screwed up. And so it means that, it means that, uh, well, it, it's not too surprising. And it's the same thing when you also look at the universe. As we try and look at the universe, anytime we have sparse data, we're likely, you never know if what you're seeing is, is, uh, is just an anomaly. 
if you have one or two events, that's why epidemiology is so useless on the whole, because you know a large medical study is three patients usually, and uh, uh, it's hard to generalize from that. And so we have one universe that most of us live in, and uh, and um, and when we see things like. Uh, uh, rare events, for example, in dark matter, there was a dis there was a claim discovery of dark matter. One or two events in an underground detector, a more recent an, uh, experiment that could now look at with the larger sample said, no, it's just an accident. And accidents happen all the time. Now, if you're looking, if you're trying to determine our lineage as humans, as I often say in, in Phoenix the other day, I was saying that uh, if if you happen to discover a skeleton of a basketball player in Phoenix and my skeleton. 100 million years from now, or 5 million years from now, or whatever, you'd say we were a different species if you didn't know any better. Unless we were both you know, in the same place and got killed in the same place, and then you might change your mind. And that's exactly what's happened. You know, it's, you, from one or two samples, often species are established, and now those we're thinking that maybe those were premature. So that, anytime we're wrong, I think it's, it's interesting. And, and, and the results on Mars have been up and down. Um, there's definitely water on Mars. Whether it was suitable for life, there's new evidence for a lake on Mars that you may have just heard a week or two ago. Um, I was just talking to CNN about it yesterday, the other day, uh, and that's interesting. Although I suspect, given the nature of the lake and how long it was there, that it's, whenever you think of water or organic materials, I think life. But the, on Earth, the life evolved probably. We well, also need more than water and organic materials. We need a rich source of energy. And, and the deep ocean vents on Earth were probably the most likely places for, for life to form, and that certainly wasn't the case on Mars. So anyway, but, it, but there's lots of, anytime we open a new window on the universe, it's exciting. And the new window on Mars is exciting, the new window on our ancient humans are exciting, and of course, the most exciting thing at all is the new window on the fundamental structure of matter. And the confirmation, and the definitive confirmation, a year or so ago when we talked, it was just sort of, sounded like it might be Higgs particle, but now it looks like it's particle, and we're waiting and that's got us primed for, for what's next when that large hadron collider turns on a year from now, 2015, a little year and a half from now, to really look and maybe reveal a whole new universe, literally, perhaps even maybe new extra dimensions. So that was the whole time, but that's that, there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, questions from the audience now. Good, because we're gonna, I'm going to go for, for dinner if you don't have any, so that's good. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. I saw a story recently that the dinosaur killing uh, asteroid might have splashed fragments of life into space not to Mars. Any comments on whether that's actually possible or not? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the interesting thing. And what, what's interesting about this recent observation of a lake on Mars is that the age of the lake, the cr Mars was, it was formed by an by impact crater. It was an impact crater. And comets delivered, there's now much better evidence that comets delivered most of the water on Earth. We used to think it wasn't the case because, because the uh, isotopic abundance was different on, the, on, on, on deuterium on the comets than it was Earth. But there's a, enough material that's been water that's been bombarding the Earth in the last four and a half billion years to account for all the oceans. And now it looks like that, that probably comets from the outer solar system have the right isotopic abundance and they could have done it. So, but anyway, this lake formed with this crater formed about 3.8 billion years ago. And what's interesting about that is that was right around the time that life was forming on Earth the oldest fossil, some of them in Australia, of that age. And so while I think it's personally, that it's highly unlikely that life would evolve in that particular environment that they just recently discovered on Mars, Mars pollutes Earth all the time, and to a lesser extent, Earth pollutes Mars. So the, the big surprise would be if we discovered evidence for life elsewhere in our solar system, as I expect we will, Maybe not extant life, but extinct life, microbial life. It would be a huge surprise if it wasn't our cousins, uh, because no planet is an island, as I like to say. We pollute, and if you look at inside a rock, the, the, the six to twelve month journey between the between the planets, microbes could certainly exist in that environment uh, and to, to make the. the Traverse. It's a little quick, easier to come from Mars, and that's why it's potentially more likely that Mars seeded life on Earth. Mars, you know, if life evolved on Mars at early times, it could have easily seeded life on Earth. And so, as I often say, if you discover, you know, if you want to look at Martians, just look in the mirror. Um, so, so 
whenever a large comet hits, it splashes things out, and some of the some of those some of the ejecta can get the escape velocity. The escape velocity on the Earth is a lot bigger than Mars, and also you have to be able to head out instead of in towards the Sun. That's why it's more likely we measure Martian meteorites all the time here on Earth. Um, we we the easiest place to find them is Antarctica because it's white, and uh, that's the only reason why the people, it's not magnetic fields or anything else, it's just it's white. And if you drive around a skidoo and you see something that isn't white, it's a meteor. And, uh, um, and that's where we discover a lot of meteors and, and a lot of pieces of Mars that have discovered there, but other ones elsewhere too. And we know that because we sent rovers there, we know the ice stuff, the mountains, materials, and, and in fact, I almost recently bought a little piece of Mars, but it was too expensive, um, <laughs> that they were selling at my university. Uh, so it's certainly possible that life goes between the planets. And so it would really be fascinating if we discover evidence for life to see if it had a, a different kind of structure. Although I suspect, from what I, what we've done at my institute, looking at the origin of life at my institute, as so as an educated layperson in that area, it looks to me, I would be amazed. I, I do think that the route to life is pretty well unique. I do think that the the, the, the use of ATP. The, the base pairs, the DNA, RNA world turning into a DNA world. I suspect that that's driven as much by chemistry as, in a unique sense. So I wouldn't be surprised even if there was a separate genesis that it had a similar. We'll see. I mean, we don't know. Uh, I was just wondering, what do you think Einstein's greatest theory or contribution was? And if it's a theory, could you explain it in layman's terms? What Einstein's greatest contribution was? Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that Einstein's greatest achievement, not your contribution, his greatest achievement was the general theory of relativity. It was a complete, it was, a, it was an amazing piece of intellectual activity, pushing the boundaries of what was known mathematically at the time. But there's also a new theory of gravity, and it also changed our picture of space and time more than anything else. Special relativity told us that space and time are related. But general relativity said that space and time are dynamical but they respond to the presence of matter, that space curves in the presence of matter and expands and contracts, as does time. And that was profoundly important. And of course, it was essential, because we could not have a consistent theory of an expanding universe without general relativity. It doesn't work in Newtonian mechanics. So while Einstein got it completely wrong, he thought, he thought his theory could only work if the universe was static. He was completely wrong. In fact, it generally predicts an expanding or contracting universe. And it's the only consistent theory that could have done that. So all of modern cosmology would not be possible without general relativity. Plus, by the way, uh, for those of you who got here by GPS, you wouldn't have been able to get here without general relativity. Because the amazing thing is that as esoteric as it is, it's essential for your GPS to work. Um, because general relativity says that clocks tick at different rates in a gravitational field. And if you actually work, and so the GPS works by satellites, eight or 10,000 miles above the Earth, moving fairly fast, and there's a special relativistic effect. But by far the largest effect is the fact that they're not, that they're atomic clocks, and they're ticking at a different rate than the clock, atomic clocks on Earth. And the way GPS works is two satellites take a, you know, look at a, a given location and, and find out the time that it takes to get the light to bounce back and forth, and, 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 and using those trajectories, and, and uh, they're, able, they're able to you know, figure out, if you have three of them especially, figure out where you are. But they got a sync in, in, a, in a period of about 15 seconds. Um, uh, certainly within the, the accuracy of GPS, and within an hour, you know, you'd be tens of kilometers away if you didn't take into account general relativity um, in those GPS things. So every time you use your GPS, you're relying on general relativity. I, and, you know, I talking about uh, Mars just before, but there are other sites around the solar system which may uh, be even more better. They may be much better source of light. So you're think, uh, example, Europa, yeah. or EO, even. So, so, is this somewhere we should be targeting in our uh, in our space? Yeah, it's just harder. Um, uh, uh, it's we sure all of this, by the way, should only be targeted without humans. Humans are a waste of time in space. Uh, no matter what anyone says, we are we are 75 kilogram bags of water. We are meant to be on Earth and not in space. 
and we and and so we can do much more with machines in space. Um, and some of my colleagues, uh, especially those who are beholden to NASA, don't agree with me that they're wrong. Um, uh, <laughs> this is usually the case. No, anyway. Um, and so we, and also in a place like Europa, we, we can't send an astronaut. We can imagine sending astronauts to Mars. It's an environment you could imagine people being on, but not to Europa. Uh, and so the trouble with Europa is it's, it's, it's got huge oceans. And they even exchange energy. Now there's been some geysers just recently this week seen from Europa. Um, uh, the Jupiter generate, the tidal forces of gravity going around Jupiter generate enough heat for those planets to be liquid, to have liquid water underneath the surface. And there are organic materials on those, in those planets, in those moons. And so it could be an ideal environment, but you'd have to drill down, you know, a mile or two of ice, and, then, and, and you have to go to there and then drill down and then try and search. And so it, it, it certainly, there are, there are proposals for missions to Europa. Um, and it would be very exciting to do, and I think it's uh, certainly more exciting from a scientific perspective than hu sending humans back to the moon, although I suspect we'll spend more money on the latter, especially now that China has sent a rover to, to the moon, because the space race is driven more by, by politics and science. And, and the fact that China has is, done this, I suspect, will prompt the United States to do some response. But um, Europa, there's EO is another change. There, there's lots of interesting possibilities. Um, and uh, uh, and Mars is just you know it's just uh, low hanging fruit in some sense. It's easier to get to, you can land on, and you can run a rover on it. And uh, but we will maybe you know eventually if we have enough money, um, send the programs. But these but the problem is that the really interesting programs get cut out because the human human program costs so much money. You got to keep humans alive for some reason. People <laughs> like it, and that costs a huge amount of money. It costs most of the money of a mission. And the International Space Station, you know, this boondoggle in the sky, is $150 billion. And as I often say, the best science we could do for it is to let it splash into the ocean and see how big a wave it makes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So given the uselessness of the human body, what are your thoughts? It's useful on, on Earth. <laughs> well on Earth. In space travel. What are your thoughts on the proposals of um, a manned colony on Mars. Well, I, I mean, I'm just, again, I was just talking about that on CNN just yesterday or the, day, the other day. Uh, well, look, I actually wrote a proposal that's in the New York Times four years ago saying if we sent astronauts to Mars, it should be one-way missions. And, and not only because there are a lot of people that I would like to send out, <laughs> but because um, it just costs too much money. There, all, almost all the costs, over 90, 5% of the cost of a round trip mission to Mars is, is the way back. Plus, we don't know how to do it in a way that will kill the astronauts. The radiation for a round trip mission would exceed, well, at least it would produce cancer. It, it would exceed the limits that, that are allowed. So there's cost and safety. So if you're going to do it, you want to send them one way and, 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 then, and then, you know, say, okay, well, we, we, in fact, after I wrote that piece, I got a um, this astronaut named Buzz Aldrin, and some of you may remember, contact, contacted me. Yeah, we, we testified together before Congress uh, years earlier. And um, he was very favorite, but he told me that Chris Kraft, and those of you who are old enough to remember, like me, the moon missions, because I was fanatically interested in them when I was younger. Chris Kraft was the voice of, of the Apollo, and the, you know, of, of mission control. He had actually calculated that you could send a single mission to Mars and leave them there and provide them with, with supplies to, to, for the rest of the life for about one twentieth the cost of a single round trip. So that's interesting. The other hand, it's just still pie in the sky because Mars is still a very hostile environment. In particular, the radiation on the surface of Mars means you couldn't live on the surface. You'd have to live underground. And, and I think when you tell people, well, okay, you're going to spend the rest of your life living underground, you can go out two or, two or three hours a day, maybe, and not the cancer for the rest of your life, you know. And then it becomes a little less attractive. But I think it will happen someday. I suspect we will send humans to Mars because the space, sending humans to, into space is much more for adventure and national pride. And I suspect, you know, some country like the United States will want to be the first country with a permanent colony on, the, on Mars. But it is gonna, but all these people who think it's gonna be done in your lifetime, I think are, are, are really, it's very expensive and, and I can't, it, it, it's exponentially more expensive 
You know, you can send people on vomit comments. I know this guy Richard Branson, and he likes to send people on these vomit comments and charge $100,000. And then, but it's exponentially more expensive to get into near Earth orbit, and exponentially more expensive to escape the Earth, and then to have something that would actually survive that. So it's just, it's hard for me to imagine anything other than a government or multi international. I, I can't see private enterprise uh, doing it, at least doing it for profit. I mean, you may have some crazy billionaires who are willing to, but it would cost, it's still, we're talking 100 billion bucks, I bet, at least. And that's real money. Um, and even then, as I say, it's not clear that we have the technology to do it easily, quickly enough. So if it's going to happen, it's not going to happen in 2025, which is what they claim. I mean, that's just right on the corner. If you wanted to do a mission for 2025, you'd have to start really preparing for it now, and you'd have to have the infrastructure in the background. So um, maybe, you know, maybe it'll happen in your lifetime, maybe. Um, and, and, uh, and it only makes sense, it indeed does only make sense to be send people one way. That part I, I agree with completely. Yeah. Uh, how did you make a name for yourself in the world of science, and what's your advice for a student such as myself to make a successful career out of science? Well, I worked hard. <laughs> you know, I think that's about 90% of it. I think. Well, and also I enjoyed it. Um, I think my advice to young people who are talented or, uh, is, is, to, is to, first of all, not, lock, not let your teachers get in the way. Not let them dampen your enthusiasm. And to not give up. I mean, in science, you know, in the, in the new movie that Richard and I made, which some of you may have seen, there's a, there's a dialogue where we go back and forth and say science is fun, and it is fun. But the point is it's hard work. And not only is it hard work, most of the time you're not making any headway. It's not true for just science, it's true for almost any kind of research. And most of the time you're, you're, you're not making any headway, and that can be very, very frustrating. And so you have to be willing to, to keep beating your head against the wall and keep trying and keep trying. And, um, and also to realize that it takes all types. So we, we have stereotypes of scientists. And those stereotypes are sometimes true, but they're not, they're not generally true. Science takes all types. You don't have to be, to do theoretical physics even, you don't have to be a mathematical wizard. You have to have mathematical aptitude. But there are, there are well-known scientists, friends of mine who I know, some Nobel Prize winning scientists, who are not mathematical wizards. I mean, you know, that kind of thing is as much luck as anything else. But, but you just keep plugging away. And you do it as long as you enjoy it. The only reason that I know that scientists like me, who do kind of useless stuff, um, continue to do it is not to save the world, but because we enjoy it. And I think as long as you continue to enjoy it, you should just keep plugging away. Now, as you call it that, some people say, well, how, you know, I like your career of, you know, becoming a whatever I'm, I'm called who speaks to the public. Um, how can I do that? And, I, and, I, and again, I tell young scientists that if you're interested in communication and writing, well, you should always write. Writing what you need to do. And I wrote tons when I was a graduate student in Postcard. They never saw the light of day. I used to submit to New York Times all the time, and, and all I'd ever see was actually other bylines with my titles uh, from the writers of the New York Times, which was suspicious. But anyway, um, but I did it because I needed to do it, and I think you need to, if you're going to want to be a writer, you have to you write. But the main thing is, if you're a scientist and you're talented, then the best thing you can do is science. And if you're interested in communicating, you can take advantage of those opportunities. And the more distinction you have as a scientist, um, the greater the opportunities are, and the larger the soap opera. And you know, in terms of my own accomplishments, well, you know, I've a bunch of a bunch of different areas, and I'm proud of it. Sort of dark energy was for me the most satisfying of my, of my the fact the fact that we realized that the universe should be dominated by the energy of space well before my good friend Brian Schmidt here actually discovered it, um, and I'm sure he didn't believe it. Um, and and uh, that was very satisfying to me. But I mean, it's really it's, it's really kind of surprising when you are. Because most of the time you're not. Anyone else? Um, no. So speaking of science communication and dealing with trying to help the public understand the role of science and the variability of science, how do you help people understand, number one, what you talked about at the beginning, that we thrive on being wrong rather than being right? How do you help? Because you know, I think the general public looks at us whenever there's two or three different theories. They're like, well, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. How do, you, how do you explain that? And then the other question is, how do you explain the idea of 
on the uncertainty that we have to deal with and try to... to well, I'm certain you, both, you hit two very important points and communicate with some, the public. Those are two of the major misunderstood areas of science. Uh, the, the, the point is that we... Um, the fact that we can find out we're wrong is wonderful. In many of areas of human activity, we, can't even, we don't even know if we're wrong. And, and the fact, so science progresses, but it doesn't, it doesn't progress by something being right and then being wrong. That's the biggest misunderstanding. Something that's right, and by right, I mean that it agrees with nature. You model nature, you make the correct predictions. That can never be wrong. It can be subsumed in a larger theory that changes it, just like Newton's law of gravity got subsumed in general relativity. But, um, but the fact that we can, and it amazes me, especially since lately I've been dealing a lot with religious issues for some reason. Um, <laughs> the fact that we can change our minds is somehow viewed as a fallibility. Yeah, I know. And, and what we do when we teach, we teach science completely and correctly. Mm -hmm. We teach it as a set of facts. When that's irrelevant, okay, it's a process of how to distinguish sense from nonsense, how to ask questions. And we really need to, to base our teaching more on the asking of questions. And, 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 the, and not knowing the answers is great. And I was just talking to someone who was asking Q&A some other place I was in the States recently. I forget where. Uh, a parent and talking to his kid. And, you know, we, as parents, we tend to not want to say that we don't know the answer. But the best thing we can say, don't know the answer. Let's, let's see how we might find out the answer. Because that's a skill that will be useful. The set of facts is useless. But the skill, the process of asking questions and, and sifting through information and just trying to distinguish what's sensible and nonsensible. The other, but the other point is uncertainty. Uncertainty is also viewed, especially in the case of the present climate change issue, as being a, and I wrote a piece on this, or at least did an interview about it, because um, the fact that we can quantify our, the fact that we have uncertainties in science that we can quantify is again unique. Uh, and um, I was asked recently on some radio program to, quantify, you know, the likelihood that there are extra universes. I said, I can't do that. I won't do that, because it's just a guess. The wonderful thing about if I had a theory, then I'd be able to quantify my uncertainty. And the great thing about science is that we can quantify. We can say that the likelihood of temperature changing between this level and this level has a 95% or 97% uncertainty. And we know that it's not just pie in the sky. We know what we mean by those numbers. And so one thing I've written about, and I'd like to write a lot more about, is, 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 is writing in praise of uncertainty. Because people don't understand that scientific uncertainty really, everything is uncertain. There's nothing that's absolutely certain. And the fact that science can quantify its uncertainty is one of its greatest strengths, not its weaknesses. Um. I want to say to the aspiring scientist, also learn how to write winning funding proposals. <laughs> it's yeah. a very good skill to get yeah. started. That's one thing. Um, and learning how to write and communicate, but, Arnold, let me just one second, even elaborate on that. I was part of a program later on at MIT when I was, I forget where I was, I was at Yale maybe, a visiting committee. And they were talking about integrating writing and, and communication into the curriculum. Because for scientists and engineers, now it's changing, but for scientists and engineers, too often, it's not at all a part of the curriculum. And when they get, you know, when they're forced to do writing, it's some random English professor who no one cares about, you know, some some lecturer, and they don't, no one ascribes any. They're not, they don't, they don't ascribe any significance to that person. So they take the course, and that's it. If instead the people that they admire, the scientists who are teaching them, say, required writing in the classroom, that would be very different, and it would be very useful because your career as a scientist or an engineer will depend as much on your ability to communicate, not just to the general public, but to your peers and to government funding agencies as anything else. I have been, you know, as chairman of the physics department for many years, I've seen many young scientists who were quite talented who didn't get the job that we were offering because when they came, they couldn't communicate. And it's sad in a way, but that's just the way the world works. Sorry, I don't, I, I, I... So, so that, was, that was just one remark. The other one is, um... My specialization is Earth observation, so I think we should point instruments at the Earth rather than in space. But um, uh, the International Space Station uh, is finally being used as a test bed for new Earth observation sensors, so it's means to have more and more use. Yeah, but you wouldn't have spent $150 billion in it. You could have done it much cheaper if exactly. you just built a dedicated one. But the real question I wanted to ask you, let's do 
the mind exercise that three people will go on a Mars mission. Would you put three atheists on it, three Scientologists, three <laughs> deeply religious um, Christian scientists, or would you put a mix on it? What? And that's a good question. By the way, Earth-based observations are sometimes useful for space. As you know, the discovery of gamma ray bursts, which are these this most energetic objects in the universe, was done because an Earth observing instrument, not not it wasn't an Earth viewing instrument, it wasn't for science, but it was for national security, looking for evidence of Russian nuclear tests. And suddenly they took out gamma rays, which is a signature, and of course what they were seeing was gamma rays coming from the other edge of the universe that we now and so sometimes instruments designed for looking up can be useful for looking down and vice versa. In terms of who I choose, of course I would want to have to choose. One, it is an interesting question that arose tremendously after I wrote that piece in the Times. There was more interest than I could have imagined. I did a lot of radio programs. And, um, and actually it got optioned for Hollywood. Someone said, can we option your op-ed piece in the New York Times for Hollywood? I said, yeah, why option it? It's in the public domain. You don't do that, but they did any. They want to make a movie about exactly that choosing those people and their life story and how they would come together before they went. And then it got silly. There were Martians and stuff. But, but, but what is interesting to me was something that was recommended independently in five different places around the country when I did radio programs. Was a, view, a listener came on and said that they would, what they would suggest was an all-woman crew with vials of sperm. <laughs> they, felt, they felt an all-woman crew would deal better with the whole process, and uh, and, and 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 then if you need, you don't need the men; you just need. <laughs> so, anyway, so maybe that's a good suggestion, but I wouldn't. Uh, I, I think that would be a huge thing, and it, it's not just three. There are four, but you've got to have this other question, which is, what's the optimal number? You know, because you've got this social dynamic situation. You've got three people. One person. We all know what it's like to be the third wheel. You know, one, there are going to be two that are going to be pals, and the other one's going to feel left out, and you've got all these dynamics. And so you, you've got to ask, what's the best group where you can temper individual problems? And, and how, can you, how can you test for that in advance? And one of the tests is used, actually, well, many of my colleagues and, and some of like my former students at, 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 when I was chair have gone down to Antarctica and wintered over in Antarctica. And there are many tests that people give to those people, because in Antarctica, you're... You're stuck for six months when you winter over. And so they all do all these tests to make sure you're not going to go crazy. And so that's um, that would be a very interesting thing to do. But I would presume, since I'm not, uh, no expert on human behavior, to judge myself. Uh, now, there's been a couple of segue points now, so I'll shift to it. Given your position on embracing uncertainty and understanding that not knowing is actually a good part of the process, and I sat through the screening of uh, the unbelievers some weeks ago. Oh. How do you make that argument to people that are not willing to accept that uncertainty is actually a good thing? Well, I mean, um, look, there's certain people you'll never reach, and um, if people aren't willing to accept arguments or listen to how how we can learn about the universe, then at some level, if their minds are so closed that they can't, they need certainty. Then I think. Um, you have to sip, I mean, look, it depends what you're trying to do. There, when we do a movie like that or I do a debate, there are lots of people I'm never going to reach. I just give up. And what I'm trying to do is reach a much broader group of people who are watching who haven't thought about those issues. And those minds are much more open. And it may be the first time they thought about it. So those are the people we're trying to reach, often trying to reach when I debate some nutty, you know, uh, a Christian apologist or whatever. You know, but 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 I think if you're really trying to reach people, what you do is, is, is gently understand where they're coming from. I mean, if you're making an effort, if you're making an effort to try and communicate, there are always barriers. And so you have to ask, where is this person coming from? What are their prejudices? What are their things that will interest them? What are the things that won't interest them? And use those things to open their minds slowly. That's why I wrote the Physics of Star Trek, for example. It's, a, it, you know, it's because many people are afraid of science, but they're not afraid of Star Trek. So I can use that. And the other aspect of that book, and, and which is relevant to so much of my teaching and to some extent lecturing, is that really the way to reach people is to have them confront their own misconceptions. You can't force it on them. But if you can get them to confront their own misconceptions and realize, you know, if I follow this line of logic through, I come to something that's ridiculous. And that's why Star Trek is so useful, because there's so many misconceptions. 
that I can have fun with that. But I think, it, so you've got to ask, why are you talking to the person you're talking to? And in public, I'm often not talking to that person because I care about that person particularly. Well, that's not always true, but certainly in Australia recently it was very true. Um, but I'm trying to talk to the much broader audience. But if you're really interested in teaching, you've got to, I often tell teachers the biggest mistake they make is to assume their students are interested in what they have to say. Because that, if you assume that, you've lost them. You have to ask, why should they be interested in what I have to say? Why? What is relevant to their personal life, their experiences, their dreams, their hopes, their fears, that this is relevant to, and try and reach through that. And so, you know, that, that's a slow and long process. But at least it overcomes that defensiveness that people get when they immediately feel you're trying to threaten their beliefs. If you, if you, if you show an interest in what they're interested in, then that people's hack will go way down and you can actually have a discussion. I actually have a question that's come through Twitter. Chris Barry asks, I think there's a gap in science communication in explaining the what rather than the how. What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, if, if, if I think science is about the how. And we, to, if he means we often explain the what, we just give it as a series of facts, which you're supposed to believe on faith. You know, you get told these facts, you're supposed to memorize in school, and they're the same as memorizing the Ten Commandments or something stupid. And, um, and so we need to understand the how, and how to get to these conclusions. And he's absolutely right that we don't do that in schools. And one of the reasons I think, and I don't presume, I have more experience in the United States, obviously. I suspect it's not that different in, in Australia. But one of the problems is, I mean, I admire teachers tremendously, public school teachers, because they're, they're at the front lines. As my friend Steve Weinberg says, they're doing God's work. And he's also making it. Um, but the, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly port, important role, as well as a difficult role. But the problem is, if you're not comfortable with the material, you'll teach to the facts. You'll teach to the book. Because you don't want to ask someone, any kid to ask the question, because you're afraid of saying, I don't know the answer. And that's the wrong attitude. And so I think the problem the reason we teach the what rather than the how is that the people doing the teaching are not comfortable enough to say either I don't know or to know enough about the how. But that's really what we should be doing. I agree. Go in the back here. Um, what's your take on the different interpretations of quantum mechanics? Do you find you take the shut up and calculate view, or do you think there really is an answer and that we can resolve it empirically? Well, I tend to take the shut up and calculate point of view for the most part. Uh, because the problem with the interpretation of quantum mechanics is it's, it's misplaced. As, my, as someone who's much smarter than me, a former a friend of mine, a mentor, sorry, a mentor, a professor at Harvard, who I knew very well, Cindy Coleman, a brilliant physicist and humorous man, pointed out that we talk about the the interpretation of quantum mechanics, but that's exactly the wrong thing to talk about. We should be talking about the interpretation of classical mechanics. Because in fact, the world isn't classical. It's quantum mechanical. The world behaves based on quantum mechanics. So you have this thing that describes the way the world behaves, and say, how can I interpret it in terms of this classical picture, which is just a poor approximation? Well, any interpretation you do is going to, therefore, be a poor, is never going to encapsulate all of the quantum mechanics. So we really should ask, how does the classical world can be interpreted, how can we understand the classical world in terms of quantum mechanics? So when people worry a lot about the interpretation of quantum mechanics, I don't worry so much because any of the interpretations seem ridiculous, but I think they seem ridiculous because we're, we're trying to do the wrong thing. But having said that, the one that in my opinion comes closest, the only one that I really think captures the essence of quantum mechanics is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says, if you take it literally, that every time you make an observation, that there, were, there are many... Quantum mechanics is not indeterministic, as many people think. It's a completely deterministic theory. It's second-order differential equations with boundary conditions, and they're completely determined. Once you give the initial conditions, the wave function of a particle after, after some time is completely determined. So there's no indeterminacy. Now, what happens is what you measure the properties of that particle based on its wave function, that's probabilistic, okay? So the particle doesn't have any specific properties before you measure. The electron is spinning, but it's not spinning in any given direction before you measure it. You'll measure it as spinning in this direction, but it wasn't spinning in that direction before you measured it. It was spinning in all directions at the same time. 
Okay, and that seems crazy, but it's true. That's just the way it is. Now, if you want to apply a classical interpretation to this, you'll say that the wave function has many, you know, gives you a probability of measuring a whole bunch of different properties of that particle. You know, it's a probability distribution. And when you do a given experiment, you're, you, and you do 100 experiments, you'll find that probability distribution to be able to measure. But in a given experiment, you, you'll measure it, and it'll, it'll be probabilistic. And so what that said, what the argument is that what in, there is many branches of the wave function, and every time you make a measurement, you force the system to be in one branch. You measure the spin to be up. There are an infinite number of other possibilities. And so every time you make a measurement, reality is, is branching. There are an infinite number of realities. And you, you follow one, it's like a stream with lots of tributaries. You follow it as you make a set of measurements. But there are a lot of other realities where, you know, where I could be asking you the question and you could be answering it, okay? And so it sounds neat. There's many worlds. It just sounds neat. It's, it does encapsulate the physics of quantum mechanics, but it doesn't operationally change anything, because you can't travel between one, you can't, unlike it often happens in Star Trek, where they do travel between the branches of the wave function, in at least one or two episodes I know of. You, you can't access those other possibilities, so it's a nice way of framing things, and it sounds very sexy, but, but I don't think it, it adds much. But, I think, ultimately, the real issue in quantum mechanics right now, the real thing that really is sort of still not fully understood is how you get classical measurements from quantum. I mean, it's almost understood. A lot of progress have been made, and I should say this, and I know I'm going to get hate mail for it, it's been made by physicists, not philosophers. There are a lot of philosophers who study the philosophy of quantum mechanics, and some of them have to reason physics. But the, but the progress has been made by physicists, and I'm just sorry, it's true. And the progress is how can you go from this quantum mechanical world to the classical world we see, and how, what does measurement mean? What does it mean to measure something? Uh, you know, you're obviously disturbing the system, but at some level. And, and more importantly, if the whole universe is quantum mechanical, so there is no outside of our universe, what does it mean if you have a closed system that's quantum mechanical? You, you know, if you're outside a system, then you can talk about measuring it. But what does it mean to make measurements in our universe if it's a quantum mechanical object? Those are still thorny questions that I don't think are fully resolved. I have a question. Um, so the double slit experiment has been repeated with um, buckyballs, and people are trying to do it now with viruses. I was wondering if it gets to a stage that, say, bacteria were able to interfere with themselves in, in a quantum mechanical state, what would that mean? And well, I think the problem with virus level things is that they're not quantum, they're not, I suspect they're not quantum mechanically based. And I mean, they're quantum mechanically based, but they're basically large enough to be classical. So in order to have, a, the double slit experiment says if you send a single electron, or if you, well, it starts with a light ray. If you send a single, if you have two slits in a, in a, in a, in a, in a screen, and if, I, if, I, if there are two slits in the screen here and I had a machine gun, if I live in the United States where we all carry machines, yeah. um, then, then, and if I just did the gun back and forth, then I kill the people behind the slits, the, you know, where the bullets can come through, right? But if I send light rays, what I don't see, I, on, a, on a screen in the back, I don't see that, I see this nice interference pattern. And you say, okay, well, the light, inter the different waves interfere. But it works out if you send a single photon through, a single one, it, it goes through both of them and interferes with itself. Now, if you try and say, is that really possible? I want to look. You shine a light, and, and then you'll see the photon go through one slit or the other. And you say, see, it only went through one slit. But then when you look, you won't see the same pattern. Because you force the photon not to be in many places at once, but in one place because you've observed it. So you've changed things. So the double slit experiment was a, was a real manifestation of the fact that particles like photons, and the same thing happens for electrons, and any quantum mechanical object are doing many things at the same time. An electron is literally going through both slits at the same time, unless you measure it. If you measure it, you can force it to be in one slit or the other. But if you don't measure it, it's doing everything. I often say quantum mechanics is like, like the White House or corporate America. Anything goes if you can't see it. Okay? <laughs> and, 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 if that's the way it is, so as long as you can't measure it, anything's happening. Now, the question is, at what stage do systems stop behaving that way? Do they behave more like bullets? And the only reason that you get these weird interference patterns is something called quantum coherence. And what that means is that the system really doesn't get affected by outside objects, or even internally. 
You know, a single electron, a single photon doesn't have internal degrees of freedom, really. And therefore, it doesn't mix up the quantum states in, in any way that becomes classical. We have a virus. You've got lots of stuff interacting. And, and it's hard for me to imagine that you're maintaining quantum coherence. I mean, we're all quantum mechanical. But we, we act classical because our bodies are interacting so, it's so complicated that any quantum correlations get washed out in a fraction of a second. And while an electron I could send through that wall, I could bounce an electron through the wall, and every now and then, it would suddenly appear on the other side with some small probability. You could do that from now to the end of the universe, run into that wall with your head first, from now to the end of the universe, and you'll never end up on the other side without creating a hole in your head or the wall. And, um, and so it's an interesting question, and it'll be interesting to see, but I, I would be amazed if viruses, at the level of viruses, are quantum mechanical. And, and, um, enough to preserve the kind of correlation. Now, there may be quantum mechanical processes that are important to life, but one of the big surprises recently is that maybe the process of photosynthesis is more quantum mechanical, Require, requires quantum mechanical correlations. So things don't behave classically, that a moving electron, photosynthesis is really the process of exciting electrons and moving them around and building up stored energy so they can slide down, be absorbed by oxygen and that energy is released and your body and does stuff. And What's been interesting is that it does appear that, at least in some plants, there are quantum correlations between processes that have different outcomes, which is very surprising because the plants sh should be very classical. So we still have a lot to learn. Lawrence, what do you think the next big discovery will be in physics? I, whenever I get asked that, I get the same answer, which is, if I knew, I'd be doing it. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point. It, 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 we don't, that's why it's called the discovery. It's because it's, we can't anticipate it. Now, there are areas where we know that are quite exciting, and we know that we have new... Whenever we have a new window, we tend to make discoveries. So there are areas of the early universe that we're going to expect we'll make discoveries in because we have new, new... We're building new telescopes to look for that. There are areas of quantum computing that are quite exciting. There's a lot of work going on in... I think in the areas of biophysics, there will be huge developments in understanding how biological systems work from a, a physical perspective. But I don't know what the discoveries will be, and that's why it's so wonderful. In fact, talking, as I said, about grant proposals, you always lie, if, you, if you're active, at least. You always lie when you write grant proposals, because you tell them what you're going to be doing in three years. And if you don't know what you're going to be doing in three years, then it's pretty boring, I mean, at least. At least in the field I'm in, which, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say it because there are long projects that require a lot of work, and I and I don't want to demean those in any way. Um, so you know, to do, do climate science, for example, we need to set up a long pattern of measurements that allow us all over the earth to measure it, and that's going to be a multi-billion-dollar project that takes many, many years. But individually, I just say what I think I'm going to be doing, but inevitably, what I'm doing in three years doesn't relate to that at all because there are new discoveries in the interim. You just have to sell it and make it seem plausible. Right, right. Okay, I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. What is it about quantum mechanics that makes it so popular with people like Deepak Chopra? <laughs> well, because well, one of the things that makes it popular with hucksters like him is that people don't understand it. So if you're trying to con people, pick an area they don't understand, and you're more likely to be able to sell, you know, snake oil. The other thing is it just so it's so new agey, right? It seems like we are, you know, connected to the cosmos that, that, you know, because the observer and the measurement are connected, somehow we're, our brains are somehow connected to the rest of the And it, 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 it touches, all, pushes all of those buttons. The people who want there to be some cosmic consciousness life. And so people like him can exploit that ignorance of, um, of coming at it's that, it's my, for me it's a sore point, because it's the only area of physics that I know where, where people get built out of money. Uh, almost no other, there's perpetual motion machines a little bit. But quantum mechanics is regularly utilized by people who con people out of money and their lives. And the, the secret, that nonsense, is based on quantum mechanics and you know, got people going in these tents and dying in Arizona and also because they somehow could communicate, they felt that they're, that they, if they thought about something, if they wanted something to happen, it would happen. And that's what quantum, quantum mechanics says. And it infuriates me. And. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, to hit a, a sore point recently, I, 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 I try not to do this, but I recently read a review of, of our movie by an, an ignoramus, and, um, <laughs> and, um, and he got mad at the fact that I jumped on a guy here in Canberra, a very nice young man, an Islamic guy about quantum mechanics. He spoke about it. But I jump on it because when people talk quantum mechanics and they use it for a point, they should understand it. 
That's all I ask, or at least have a basic uh, idea. But if they exploit it to somehow allow it to seem like there's no reality that's real, then I get mad and I don't tolerate that. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I just want to ask, who's your favorite scientist if you had one, and if you had to pick one through history, and why? Who's my favorite scientist? Oh, okay. Yeah, and why? And you know, people why? again ask me that. I don't, I don't pick favorites for anything. I almost don't, I don't think that way. I, I, don't, I don't rank things in terms of, sort of, you know, number one, two, three, or four. They're, they're all very different. There are a lot of scientists who've made incredible contributions, and they're all important in their own way. And, and so, but it's almost true for almost everything. I get asked my favorite, my favorite X, Y, and Z all the time, and it's hard for me to answer, because I just don't think that way. But there are obviously people who've made huge contributions, and, and they're all well known. It's no surprise. Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, Charles Darwin. In fact, I did, I did surprise some science magazine a few years ago by saying that if I had to rate, if I was really forced to rate Albert Einstein versus Charles Darwin for the impact and importance of what they did, I, I'd put Charles Darwin higher. And, that, and but we physicists have done a much better, we're much better at public relations than the biology. And, and so we, well, Einstein has had this cachet, also because it seems so hard. Biology just doesn't seem so inaccessible. Evolution is really quite simple. So, it, it, you know, the stuff that seems too complicated for the average person to understand, therefore, seems like it's a greater accomplishment. But in terms of the impact of one man changing an entire field through a combination of observation and theoretical ideas, I don't think there are many people that can compete with Darwin. I had another question through Twitter. Nick Andrew asks, are there any quantum physics experiments we can do at home with readily available materials? Yeah, sure. Take your, see this? This is a quantum physics experiment. It, this wouldn't work if it wasn't quantum mechanics. It didn't rely on semiconductors and quantum processes. It, all of modern electronics relies on quantum mechanics. And every single day, the properties of materials, the properties of semi semiconductors, the properties of essentially every computer chip and every electronic device that governs your life is a quantum mechanics experiment. So uh, if you want to do the experiment, just turn on your iPhone. The fact that it works is that it's a quantum mechanics experiment. Now, if you want to say, can I do an experiment that demonstrates quantum mechanical phenomena? Yes. And one way to do it is, to, is with high temperature superconductors. You can get these magnets now that, that are, that are, that, um, that are superconducting magnets that are at a temperature as low as, 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 as liquid nitrogen will, will become magnetic and superconducting, basically. And superconductivity, is a, it, which says you can send a current around without any loss of resistance, is an intrinsically quantum mechanical phenomenon. It's a fact that the heart of quantum mechanics could never happen classically. And so, if you wanted to take one of these high temperature superconductors and, 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 and have it levitate, uh, put in liquid nitrogen, levitate off another magnet, that's an explicit example of superconductivity and, and, uh, and quantum mechanics. But it's around us every day. We rely on it. It's not, it's not so, I mean, it's exotic, but it's, it's the bread and butter of our modern economy. Now we, oh, okay. There goes an early dinner. Couldn't you just put a cat in a box? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, put a cat in a box. But the problem is that you, that you only manifest the quantum mechanics when it's, until you open it. And that's the last um, I, I read recently that apparently every time you quantum entangle two things, you get a wormhole for free. Do you have any sort of comments or, on that? Or? Well, yeah, sure, it's wrong. Not true at all. Okay. Not true at all. You, you, uh, but quantum entanglement is very interesting, and we use it. It's, it's, it's maybe the basis of quantum computing and and and, and secure messaging, and also, unfortunately, also ways to break bank codes for credit cards. It really says that this weird thing that two particles on the opposite side of our galaxy are really not separate. They're really the part of the same thing. And so if I make a measurement of one of them instantaneously, and I mean instantaneously, I affect the state of that other one. It's not the speed of light, and it doesn't violate relativity. And the reason is classically we think the particles are separated. But their wave function is entangled only if, by the way, that you haven't let them interact with anything along the way between here and the other end of the galaxy. The minute they interact with stuff, they're no longer entangled. But if you very carefully prepare particles, and we've done it 10 kilometers away, 20 kilometers away, where you can instantaneously 
change, affect the, 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 the state of one particle by another. And we can use that entanglement to relay messages, but not faster than the speed of light. But it's fascinating. But wormholes aren't involved. No. And we, we probably can't create wormholes. No. This is just a silly question. Okay. You watch the Big Bang Theory, and what do you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do watch the Big Bang Theory, and I, I'm, I've been privileged, but not as privileged as some of my colleagues. Um, they've invited me on the set of the Big Bang Theory, and my books are in, in, in Sheldon's apartment. Oh, I'm happy to say. Okay. If you look on the wall, and, which I do in every episode, <laughs> I, I look for them. Um, and, but I have not yet been on the show, but I have been there when they've been taking him. It turns out the producers were fans of the Star Trek. I, I, I originally didn't like the program because I thought it's stereotype, you know, scientists. But it's very clever and really, and the characters are actually very likable. So I think it's a wonderful program. I really enjoy it. And what did you think of the movie Gravity? Yeah. <laughs> the what? The movie Gravity. I thought it was incredibly boring. <laughs> I mean, I just thought it was a three hour, I mean, ten minutes would have been great. It was a movie without a point. It was beautiful photography full of nonsense from a physics perspective, so I couldn't suspend disbelief long enough to enjoy it. But there was no plot, there was nothing interesting, there was just this incredible, albeit, cinematography. But I'm amazed at the reaction, is, well, I, I'm now, my, after having <coughs> made a movie, my impression of film critics has changed tremendously in terms of their intelligence. But, um, <laughs> but I can't understand the reaction. It is a beautiful film, it'd be a great film, to, uh, well, it'd be a great film to get stoned and go see, I guess I'll say. <laughs> but, but I'm sure, just like 2001 Space Odyssey, but that was much more substance. This one was just so silly. That, to me, the, the, the first scene that just had me lose interest was when the, when, you know, when the International Space Station is bombarded by these, you know, this remnants of this Russian satellite. And it gets hit, and then it falls. But one should fall. That's not how it works, Norman. And Norman, all things are falling. As long, you know, if it, it's still moving in the same velocity, it doesn't fall. You know, so we, it all, of course, our intu intuition is you, you turn off the rockets and suddenly things fall. But there are no rockets operating in the International Space Station. It's continually falling, because that's what an orbit is. It just keeps missing the Earth. As Newton showed in the Principia, one of those beautiful diagrams in the history of science, if you look at the Principia, a beautiful diagram. He, he, he's a diagram of the Earth and then a little mountain. And, and he shows, like you, throw up, you shoot a cannonball with a cannon, and it falls the trajectory and hits the Earth. You hit another one further, it goes down, and the Earth is perfect. You hit another one further, it goes down, and hits the Earth. And you hit one that's faster, and it keeps missing the Earth. And, he was, and it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful image, and it's, a, it's just uh, part of his genius. Yes? I guess this one looks like you may have another Twitter one. No. I'll ask a better question this time. If um, if the graviton is discovered, or if it's confirmed, what would that mean for quantum mechanics and string theory? Well, I mean, it's a very good question. As you probably know, I've been writing about this a lot because I think we propose the only way that gravitons could ever be shown to exist. Although we haven't yet convinced the referees. Well, we're right, but we haven't convinced the referees. Um, uh, but um, quantum mechanics is a big problem. I mean, gravity is a big problem in the sense that it doesn't lend itself easily to the to quantum mechanics. It's the only, and so at a, fun, a very small level, which is only the, le the level that's so remote that it doesn't matter for our, our lives and everyday work, but at a very small scale, at some level, if we want to reconcile quantum mechanics and gravity, we need to do something, because general relativity appears to be a theory that doesn't make sense when you try to apply quantum mechanics. Some people have proposed that maybe quantum mechanics doesn't apply to gravity. Maybe the gravity, maybe at that fundamental level, but the world isn't quantum mechanical level. You know, at a really small level. It's, it's not a sensible proposition, but it's nevertheless a proposition that isn't, that can't be ruled out at this point. There are no really good theories of it that, that, that hold water. So we'd like to see that the particle that conveys, in, in quantum mechanics, every field and every force is conveyed by a particle. So the electromagnetic waves that we see as light, that convey the electromagnetic force are made up of a coherent superposition of particles called photons. And the same is true for all the other forces in nature. The weak forces due to the exchange of particles called W and Z particles, and the strong force due to the exchange of particles called gluons. And so gravitational waves we know exist. We've never measured them directly, but we have measured them indirectly, and a Nobel Prize has been given for that, by, because an amazing experiment by a, uh, an old friend of mine who's at, at, at uh, Princeton, an amazing experiment done over 20 years, um, 
if, you, if, you, if basically an orbiting neutron, two orbiting neutron stars, a, a binary pulsar, and, and if you you could calculate that as one, if, if they're in empty space, the only way that this object, the primary way that it loses energy is by the emission of gravitational waves. And you can calculate in general relativity what, you know, how, how it should change the orbital period. And it changes the orbital period by something like one ten millionth of a second every year. And what is amazing is that they were able to pick out the Earth's, the, even continental drift on the Earth has to be incorporated in all of these measurements on the Earth. It's just a beautiful experiment. Joe Taylor and, and, and a former student has made, and they deserve the Nobel Prize for it. Because in fact, the observations of the change in that period agreed to within 1% of, of the predictions of general relativity. So we know that general relativity which predicts the emission of, gra of gravitational waves whenever I move a mass. Whenever I move a mass, I'm emitting gravitational waves. But gravity is so weak that those gravitational waves take very, very little energy and are not measurable directly yet. We, we're creating these big detectors. And some interesting work in Australia is going towards build, helping build these quantum mechanical detectors that will help try and detect gravitational waves. But no one has, but there, and the physics tells us that gravitational waves are a coherent superposition of particles, which we call graviton. But no one's ever been able to do a measurement of a graviton. And my, another friend of mine, Freeman Dyson, has written cogently, arguing that there's no terrestrial experiment you could ever do that would actually detect individual gravitons. Because the experiment would collapse into a black hole before it could detect gravity. <laughs> Basically, that's the, the, the difficulty. And what we, what a colleague of mine, Frank Wilczek, uh, and I showed recently, is that the universe can provide such an experiment. It actually, the universe can do what we can't do on Earth. It can take a quantum mechanical signal and turn it into a classical observer. <coughs> and we propose that that would happen, and we can prove it's quantum mechanical. So if we see gravitational waves from the early universe, we know they're produced by quantum mechanical processes and then the gravitizers. And that tells us, if that's the case, that really we need to that we need to reconcile gravity and quantum mechanics, and we need a, a theory of quantum gravity, and the one we have doesn't work. So it would be profoundly important in an intellectual sense. I have to say from a perspective of what it would impact in the rest of science, it wouldn't impact it a lot. You know, that's what I used to get so mad about my, when my colleagues who were working on string theory in the 1980s talked about a theory of everything. It isn't a theory of everything, it's a theory of almost nothing. <laughs> because even if it was, a, and it's profoundly interesting to me, but even if it is a theory of quantum gravity, which by the way, would be the theory we need to understand t equals zero at the beginning of time. So from a scientific philosophical perspective, that's what we need to understand the beginning of our universe, so it's incredibly important. But that process is irrelevant everywhere except at the beginning of the universe. And in terms of understanding anything else in science, it would, it would not help you at all. It would truly give you a theory of the four forces of nature, which would be useful, but it wouldn't help you understand how oatmeal boils or, or, whether it's, or, or, how, or, or how climate change is happening on Earth. And so uh, we have to recognize that while it's sexy stuff, and it's what got me interested in, I got interested in the kind of work I do because it seemed like it was the most fundamental kind of science. And, 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 and there was this great public relations campaign about Newton and Einstein and Feynman and other people that got me excited. And, 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 what I do to some extent excites other people, and and that's great, but 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 it, it's not everything, and so uh, but it is from a philosophical perspective. If we ever want to understand to truly know what the beginning of the universe was like, then we have to have a theory that makes sense, and we don't have one right now. So everything's just a guess. Even even the theories I talked about in my most recent book are educated guesses. Do you have any more yes. There's been a recent article about a computer model suggesting the universe is a hologram. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people love that. Um, well, it's, it's good, good press. Um, well, that idea is not new, by the way. It's been around for a long time in string theory. String, there was a, a very interesting bit of mathematics proposed by then a graduate student, actually. He's now a professor at the Institute for Grand Study, Juan Valdezena. And it, you can show that it's amazing that that all the, just like a hologram, which is a two-dimensional plate, and you look through and you see all the information of the three-dimensional object. So if I took a photograph of this room, um, I wouldn't see your shoulder because the man in front of me is blocking it. But if I took a holographic picture, then I could go like this and I could see your shoulder. Okay? So all of the three-dimensional information is stored in a two-dimensional plate. So in some sense, the three-dimensional image is redundant. I can store all of that information in, in a two-dimensional plate. Okay? And what's been shown is that in certain cases, for certain mathematical systems, all of the information 
What you can you can choose to solve a problem in a four-dimensional universe by treating it as a as a in some cases as a three-dimensional universe with different laws. That all that the physics is the, the physics is exactly the same. And therefore you could say, well, maybe all of the information on our universe is stored somehow in a, in a it, it is stored in a, in a, in a, on the surface of the universe rather than embedded inside. But the problem is that that sounds nice, but this mathematical equivalence works for only very specific physical theories and, and mathematical systems. And so whether it, and those systems do, do not describe the universe we live in. Now, whether at some more fundamental level they would is an open question. So it's fascinating from a mathematical perspective, but it's just, it's a way of, of it, it's a way of promoting this interesting work, but it's, it's the, well, we have no evidence that the universe is a hologram and that dimensionality doesn't mean, or that there's extra dimensions. It just is a wonderful mathematical tool that allows us to solve some problems in, say, the theory of the strong interaction in, in, in four dimensions by or in five dimensions by substituting it with a theory of gravity in four dimensions. You can show there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between those theories. That's amazing. Now, you could show it, and the reason there was a, an article about this in the, in the newspapers is that it was, a, it was a lemma. It was a postulate. Malvasina looked at certain mathematical quantities and they seemed similar. And he said, there's probably a correspondence. But no one's been able to prove it. And so what these people have done is detailed computer simulations of detailed calculations in the two systems, and the end results are the same. That gives a lot more evidence that that theory, that, that mathematical postulate, as a mathematical fact or a mathematical idea is correct. But it doesn't say anything about our universe. Yeah. Oh. We talked about the Big Bang Theory, um, but there's also... The TV show or the... Or the, the TV oh, show. Oh, okay. there's, there's also uh, Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who. Why do you think uh, science and scientific, scientific themes are so popular in entertainment? Well, because they, there's two... I mean, science fiction has been popular for a long time for a number of reasons. One is, I mean, I think because everyone asks themselves, I question everyone looks up the stars at night and would love, you know, we want to know if we're alone, first of all. And we all feel terrible that we can't travel to the stars, that we're stuck on Earth. So playing off those hopes that are universal works. But also, I think uh, it, it, science fiction inspires people in a, in, a, in a way because it frees their imagination to imagine many possible worlds, just as literature does. Literature, literature is inspiring because you imagine a world that doesn't exist. But it's a plausible world that might exist because most of literature, you know, it's some historical or someone murdering someone or whatever else. Science fiction gives you one bit more latitude to create not just a, a, a plausible world that might exist, but a plausible world where the rules are different. And we all feel sad that we're constrained, that we can't fly, that we can't do this or we can't that. So we can imagine out there somewhere those things are possible. We also live in a world where technology has changed the world so much that the world today would have just seemed like magic to, to 50 years ago or someone. And so we can imagine the world 50 years from now will be magical to us. But the other reason that science fiction, I think, is so wonderful for people is it allows us to talk about things that we couldn't talk about in the context of another, any other kind of literature because it hits too close to home. But if you imagine a world, and it, like, like um, like uh, Abbott did in, in, when he wrote um, Flatland uh, in the 1800s. He, he wrote a beautiful mathematical romance, which kind of was kind of a science fiction of extra dimensions. But what he did was satirize the ridiculous Victorian rules of the day between men and women and everything else. He couldn't have written that in the context of literature. It would have been too, too tumultuous. It would have been it, too many historic points. But in the context of science fiction or Gulliver's Travels, he could also he can also satirize the world that we live in by showing how another world is so ridiculous where people have wars based on whether which side you want to break an egg on. And so I think science fiction allows that liberty to satirize. The first interracial kiss that was ever done on TV was done in Star Trek. It could never have been done in a Western or in a, or in a regular TV show. But it's okay in imagining in the 23rd century because it's a different world than our own. But it still represents the kind of racism that was prevalent at the time. So I think that's another thing science fiction allows people to over. Um, I just want to ask about uh, uh, 
uh, supersymmetry in particle physics. Uh, it seems to me that um, theoretical particle physicists talk an awful lot about supersymmetry, and we hear very, very little from the experimentalists. <laughs> I guess, firstly, how far off do you think we are from experimentally uh, finding supersymmetric particles? I think, we, well, supersymmetry is, we hear experimentalists talk a lot about it because they rule it out. Yeah. <laughs> they're limiting it. But, but the Large Hadron Collider, if you wish, really wasn't designed, it was designed to search for the Higgs, but most of us felt what was really, its real likelihood was, would be made in discovering supersymmetry. So I think it's potentially a year and a half off um, when the super collider, the, when the Large Hadron Collider turns back on after being upgraded with higher energy and higher luminosity. It's, not, it's turned off now, but not because its job is over, its job is just beginning. And, and if supersymmetry, which means it's a wonderful new mathematical principle that suggests a lot of new particles in nature and may explain why the Higgs has the properties it does, and it is the basis of string theory. Now, discovering supersymmetry wouldn't tell us that string theory is correct. But not seeing supersymmetry also, unfortunately, doesn't tell us that string theory is wrong because it could exist at a level we can't probe in our experiments. But most of our ideas suggest that the value of supersymmetry, the, re the things that recent theorists proposed it, was that it solves problems on the scale related to the Higgs part. And therefore, if it, it manifests itself in nature, we should discover it by discovering a whole bunch of new particles we turn on the Large Hadron Collider next. And so it could be, literally be around the corner. If it isn't discovered, which of course is more interesting, it does mean that these ideas we have about how to understand why the Higgs particle exists the way it does and why the weak interaction is the way it is, those ideas are fundamentally wrong. And as I point out, that makes it more exciting. Especially if you're a young scientist who wants to make a name for themselves by coming up with the right ideas. Okay. Two final two questions. Okay, these two. These two here, yeah. yeah. You and then you. Okay, well, I don't know which order. Okay, you first and then you, because you're yeah, Which one do you want? You're the moderator. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, I can forget. Okay. A simple question. Uh, I've listened here, and I've done it a few times, to you talking about uh, particle physics, physics and uh, quantum mechanics and all that. And what I find is that it all sounds very nice, but I can at some point listen to that and say, is that the way I'm just imagining something I don't understand, actually, without going, do the math and do yeah. the hard yeah. And um, is there actually any um, interpretation that is acceptable in general, or does every physicist have to build their own picture in their mind, and there's no. actually no, sure, there's no requirement to have? The same picture, right? No, we all have exactly the same picture, and that's why we, it progresses and it works. Starting with something called Schrodinger's equation, it describes for non relativistic particles like electrons around certain atoms exactly the atomic energy levels of atoms. It makes the best predictions in all of nature. Not quite the best predictions, because it's wrong at some level, because the electrons behave relativistically, so you need a relativistic quantum mechanics. We created such a thing called quantum electrodynamics. And that is a theory we all use, and it is the and it is the best scientific theory in existence. It's it's the only scientific theory that allows you to math make mathematical predictions and compare them to experiment to 14 decimal places on the basis of first principles. There's nowhere else in science we can do any calculation on the basis of first principle science and 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 predict a result of 14 decimal places. That allows us to do it. We all use it for that reason because it works. So we all speak the same language, and that's really important. Everyone, different cultures, different religions, different languages, we all communicate using exactly the same language of, of, of mathematics. And that's why the Large Hadron Collider, which was built by physicists from over 100 countries speaking dozens of languages, and again, dozens of different cultures and religions, they all spoke the same language. Because science, unlike religion, science unifies us. Science puts everyone on the same page because we're all subject to the same laws of nature. And it's a wonderful example of the way that humans can coexist, function, and work together and respect each other, uh, independent of any of those other, other human frailties. I find that that's, to me, one of the greatest aspects of science is that it gives an example of the fact that, that humans can transcend all of the, the myopia that is inbred in us, from a personal perspective, a cultural perspective, we can overcome that at some level. Maybe not in our entire lives, but at some level, and work together. And I think that's just wonderful. Yeah. And just, sorry, yeah. just for 
Well, you need to look one second. Yeah, okay, yeah. continue for a uh, second. I understand, and I know that mouth can work, and there's a common language, and everything works, but when you close your eyes and think about it, you're thinking, at least I, okay, I shouldn't say you, I think in a classical way. So when you say there's a double slit experiment, I think double slit, you know, and all that, and say the wave function goes there. Well, forget the wave function. Actually, you you can picture classically. The electron is doing everything at once. Every time an electron goes from here to there, it, does, it takes every possible path in the universe at the same time. That's the classical picture, and it works. It goes to the moon and back. That's what mathematics says, but the question is... No, physically. It's not mathematics. We can test that. It's physically doing everything at once. It is going to the moon and back. I mean, there's a mathematical description, but I find that it's difficult to actually imagine it in a classical way. Oh, it is. It's difficult for all of us. stuff you don't see. Well, I know that some of you know I wrote a book by Richard Feynman, and you know, Feynman said if you, if, you, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. In fact, Feynman, you know, won the Nobel Prize for his work in quantum electrodynamics, and I named the book Quantum Man. But he actually was quite interested in quantum computers, and his argument for it was, if I can make a quantum computer, maybe I can understand quantum mechanics, because I don't have it. So it was interesting. Okay, and the final question, the back there. Oh, the pressure to, to have the last question, it better be interesting. Yeah? So um, if you had a couple of billion dollars at your disposal to spend on uh, particle physics, where would you spend it? <laughs> <laughs> <That's a great laughs> well, I think the best bet right now is the Large Hadron Collider. I think it's the best. Now, there are other places you can look for interesting effects, um, maybe with neutrinos, for example, which are still my favorite particles in nature. But unfortunately, you know, some people think that science, we want to spend money just because we want to spend money. But unfortunately, the laws of physics tell us that the only way to explore nature on very, very small scales is to have a lot of energy. It's a property of quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle. To resolve things on small physical scales requires a lot of momentum and then a lot of energy. It's just a law of nature. And so we have no choice but to build higher and higher energy machines. There's no way around it. Now, we may, each, as things continue, our waves of accelerating particles get smarter and smarter. And we may do it for less. But the Large Hadron Collider is the most complicated machine that humans have ever built. It is amazing that it works. It is, it is, it is unfathomable, almost, I, I, that it works. And to think about the fact that it's 26 kilometers around with a superconducting magnets that are bigger than any of the magnets you find in MRI machines or anywhere here. 26 kilometers around superconducting, so that means the temperature in that tunnel has to be colder than the temperature in outer space near the Earth. The vacuum in that tunnel has to be rarer than the vacuum near the International Space Station. We create a vacuum that's better than space, that's colder than space, that operates with superconducting magnets over 26 kilometers, accelerating particles at 99.999999% the speed of light in different directions. Each instant, the collisions produce more information that are detected by the detectors. Over 1,000 terabytes of information in each set of collisions, and there are a million collisions each second more than the information contained in all the libraries on Earth, and how to sift through that and throw out almost all of it in a way to find out what's happening is amazing. It's amazing that we can do it. And so I think it's, um, it's not just, of course it's esoteric. And of course it's expensive, but in a global sense it really isn't expensive, right? $10 million over 20 years in a global sense is, as I, you know, is less than, as I point out, the air conditioning cop bill in Iraq during the Iraq war in a week, okay? Um, so, you know, it's a lot more useful. Um, and so, it's, it's esoteric, but it's not that expensive in a global sense. And it's, it's humans pushing technology and their abilities to the very limits. And whenever you do that in any area of human activity, you're going to benefit. And uh, even, if it, even if you discover something you didn't expect. Or even if it's just creating technology like computer technology, like the web, which was of course created at CERN because you have thousands of physicists in different parts of the world that need to work on the same data without knowing where the computer is. And, you know, it has to be invisible, and that's how the web was created. So, but I don't believe in justifying these experiments by their, by their side benefits, and unfortunately we've done that too often in particle physics and in space. If it's interesting, you've got to convince people it's just worth doing for the sake of doing it. But anytime you, you build that kind of technology, you're going to produce breakthroughs that are going to trickle down in the rest of the the world for years to come. So it's not very original, but the large hadron collider still, I think, is the way I would spend that kind of money. And we don't, yeah, we don't have to spend it for the most part. It's already been spent. But still, we have to maintain 5,000 scientists working long hours and uh, 
but you know that that's good for the economy too. <laughs> okay, on that note, I'd like to bring the lecture to a close. So thank you very much, Professor Kraus. You'd like to make a presentation, I believe? What? Who, where, what? What's happening? I'm so sorry. Can I bring my uh, alumni up with me? What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh, presents. <laughs> Uh, we'd just like to thank you on behalf of the National Youth Science Forum. Professor Krauss has been a supporter of ours for some time, and uh, we have two new t-shirts in our range. That looks like they're being modeled. These are two of our alumni. love these t-shirts. This is Iron Man. Well, this is great. This is great. I have two people that are very close to me here in Canberra who are going to really love wearing these. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And on behalf of Canberra Skeptics, I'd like to give you this as a token of our appreciation for coming to speak to us again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, that brings the lecture to a conclusion.